Mitch Tomasho, it's so good to see you. You've done such extraordinary work, a leader in environmental education in this country and affected many people, many institutions, especially through your teaching at Antioch. But your books, your, te your talks um, have been very, very important for our collective thinking, our community. Your participation in our Living Earth Community Conference at Oak Spring was absolutely magnificent. You have some very specific and extraordinary ideas um, for us to think about, uh, like biological network archetypes and so on. Um, this communication that is taking place in nature that you've lifted up, up for our visit into our visibility. So I'd love to begin there. I'd love you to uh, extend that out, how this matters for environmental education, but also ecological thinking. And then in this interview, we'll go to your amazing wrap up for the conference where you really inspired us, lifted us off to think about where do we go from here? So let's begin with um, the sense of the communication that's taking place in nature from mycelium, tree roots, Earth systems, all the way up to the galaxies. And give us a sense of how you see this and its importance for, for us right now as we're thinking our way forward. Well, first, I want to come back at you and thank you for your gracious comments, but also thank you for the you know, extraordinary work that, that you have done um, and, and also how much you've always supported my work. And uh, that, that's, uh, that, that, for me, that's one of the, the great gifts of my intellectual life, really, is, is to have that support from you and to be engaged in, in, in many different ways in some of the things that you've done. So I really do appreciate that. And I've often said to you before, I, I see you as a world-class intellectual diplomat for how we think about religion and ecology. And the influence that you've had has, has been absolutely stunning. Um, I'm really interested in the challenge of environmental learning. That's what my career has been all about. And I feel like we're at a turning point right now. Um, there have been extraordinary distractions. Um, everything's been pushed to the side by, um, by racism and, um, and, and the emergence of hatred, um, you know, as exemplified um, by leadership in America. And uh, that's, that is so um, um, disappointing and it requires all of us to respond. So the, the challenge then is how do we respond to all of this within the context of what we believe in and what's important to us and that is environmental learning. So my comments on networks are part of a much bigger project and the project is a new book which will be out about a year from now called To Know the World, Why Environmental Learning Matters. And I feel like we need to state that as clearly and as inspirationally um, and as connectively as we possibly can. So there are many things, I'll go over them later as we discuss this further, but networks and connections have become a singular aspect of, of, of the contemporary era. Interestingly, I start, your, the paper that you're referring to is uh, a small piece of a bigger chapter. And the chapter starts with a reminiscence of my recent visit to the Golden Spike. And uh, I was, it's in Promontory, Utah. And in 1869, the nation was connected through this Golden Spike. Uh, there's actually a lurid history of what that entailed from a uh, the point of view of, of shaky investments, uh, various types of shaky financial schemes, the use of uh, of really indentured labor, but it, it, it struck me as so interesting that here in the middle of the desert, the entire country became connected and east and west and all of the different paths were now one. And in many respects, that was the conceptual template for today's internet. Now, of course, we talk about social media and social connectivity and networks and um, network thinking, yet as far as I can tell, there's virtually no instruction in it. And it certainly hasn't been incorporated or internalized as part of how we think about environmental education or what I like to describe as environmental learning, because very often environmental education is trivialized as birds and bunnies. So I like to describe it as environmental learning to make it as serious as it ought to be. Um, 
So I wrote a chapter on both ecological and social networks. And to answer, to finally answer your question, we are surrounded by ecological networks and we're first beginning to understand uh, the depth of them, the intricacy of them, the complexity of them, um, the spirit, if you will, that moves through them, uh, or perhaps the sentience engaged um, through these networks. And one of the participants, um, uh, David George Haskell, at um, the Oak Spring community, wrote a wonderful book, The Song of Trees. We, he and I talked about this at some length at the gathering, and I'm grateful for that. And he writes on, at some length about uh, mycelium and how mycelium form this connective tissue and different species speak with each other through mycelium. So it occurred to me also after reading Paul Stamets, the great mycorrhizal um, writer, nar uh, narrator and researcher, is that mycelium are the original internet, which is uh, Stamets' conception. Yet how many of us think about that? We don't, but as we speak right now and as we look at the forest around me, this forest is constantly in communication with other species, with the biosphere. And I feel that as a way to think about social media and social connections, that's the place where we have to start. We have to start by understanding the intricacy of these connections, the beauty and aesthetics that uh, are manifest in them. Uh, and as I mentioned in the piece, at every, at every scale, you're gonna see these extraordinary networks at the scale of galaxies, perhaps, that galaxies, in fact, have some level of communication at the scale of quantum physics, that all these scales that we can barely perceive or understand, but there are levels of communication, um, uh, sentience, uh, deep, 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 deep awareness that we can barely even penetrate that are all going on. So that's the big picture. And I think that fits very well with the universe story. Then we get to social media and we ask the question, okay, how does this impact the 19 year old or the 25 year old or the adult who's constantly engaged in thinking about his or her social relationships. And I think there's a correspondence there. So in the body of the chapter, I write about that correspondence and I encourage people to think about the relationship between social networks and ecological networks. One last point, a lot of the latest research as I understand it about cities suggests that in fact cities are a form of hybrid networks. Because of the human impact and because of the ecological relationships, we're learning things now about the dynamics of ecological and social relationships in cities that require an entirely new language. And that would be the language of these hybrid networks. And I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Well, that's fantastic. And I'm sure your book will be a great contribution to this um, really way of thinking. So it's a way of thinking and learning that embeds us in these systems, right? It's not just abstract. One of your beautiful books, Coming Home to the Biosphere, um, is, is this challenge for us to see ourselves as biocultural beings, not just human beings or social beings. And I think um, your work is pointing us in that direction. Maybe just one other thing to say, and I'd love you to comment on how this relates to coming back to the biosphere um, is, you know, Confucian thinking, as you know, has the human in the center, but in relationship to family, to society, to educational systems, uh, to political systems, to nature and to the cosmos itself. So that sense that we are embedded in these concentric circles um, is very strong in certain traditions, but that's a recovery. And your marvelous uh, sensibilities of the, these biological networks um, and at every scale then to earth and cosmos. Um, so how, how would you say this helps us uh, return to the biosphere? That's a, that's a great comment. And it's, it, actually the book is bringing the biosphere home. I mean, the same thing just stated somewhat differently. And the reason why it's bringing the biosphere home is because I think home place is where all of this always starts. I've always been very influenced and believe deeply in place-based education, as long as we understand that being place-based is a way to see into the deeper levels of space and time, which is what bringing the biosphere home is. And in many respects, this, this new book is uh, an amplification of many of those and a reworking of many of those ideas. Um, I like that you brought the Confucian element in and Rev Cook, uh, one of the great, you know, in the great Jewish rabbinical traditions has a very similar uh, conceptualization in his work as well. And that is these concentric circles of learning and awareness. And, you know, I have my family here this week. And so I've been spending a lot of time with a seven-year-old and a nine-month-old. And it's just, 
it's just magnificent to watch their focus on what's right in front of them and how that expands out. And, and many, I'm learning so much just by returning to the basics of, of, of what's right in front of you at any given moment in time. There's something else that occurred to me uh, as you were writing this. As you know, I'm very interested in, in the I Ching. And I'm also, I'm a musician. I'm very interested in music. And I was flipping through a book this morning which looks at all the different musical scales around the world and their relationship to consciousness. Mm -hmm. And one of the chapters is about Chinese musical systems and the cycle of fifths and how every, and this is very much by the way, within the Confucian tradition, apparently, as I, as I read in the book this morning, every vibration continues to reverberate until the human can no longer hear it, but it's still reverberating throughout the universe. And so you start with the vibration that's right in front of you, and then it expands, and then it expands. And that's the attitude that I think environmental learning has to convey as well, that it's, we, we'll never get to those deeper levels if we don't start with what's right in front of us, the home base. Beautiful, beautiful. And I love that sense, because for the Confucians, music is what grounds us and orients us, and these vibrations are crucial to us. And your mention of the I Ching, the Book of Changes, is doing exactly that, bringing the biosphere home so that we know our place, sense of directions, the seasons, the colors, the mythical animals, and so on. So traditions have had this, and what you're helping us to see is through ecology, through science, um, the depths of the connection that we understand, not just mentally, but physically and spiritually. And it gives us a profound sense of belonging, which is what humans want, for sure. It, it does. And it also, hopefully, it heightens the sense of mystery. And mm -hmm. the, I mean, the existential challenge with all of this is that the, uh, any time a path is opened, you, you realize uh, the conditions of your own unknowing. Mm -hmm. and how, how beautifully humbling that is. So I have a, the final section of this new book is called Perceptual Reciprocity, because mm -hmm. it's my view that everything perceives. That doesn't mean ascension necessarily, but everything perceives. And I start the section off by discussing a, a, a swim I took in a nearby lake, and, uh, and I go into the swim in great detail because it was just a beautiful, beautiful morning where there are layers of fog and layers of clouds. And, um, and I realized that, I, all I ever got was a glimpse of the openings to a higher kind of awareness. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to do because we're so distracted all the time. But just that glimpse was good enough. You know, it's to know that those glimpses are out there and during really special moments of time, you have access to them. And I think that ought to be the goal of a lot of environmental learning is how do we provide all of us with these glimpses through the fog where we, we, get, we deepen that awareness. And I know, again, it's through your own work and the journey um, and all that goes with it is a way to try to open people up to these bigger picture questions about meaning and purpose. And, and I think that's the bottom line foundation of what we have in common as thinkers. Yes, that is so beautiful. I love the sense of the mystery and purpose, wonder, awe, beauty, which is, of course, what Rachel Carson was asking us to do, what Journey of the Universe is as well. So I thank you for that marvelous image of your swimming in, in the lake. Um, and I think that that sense that activates, as you say, these glimpses, gives us a resilience for the work that needs to be done in these very difficult times, and, right? So we're, we're looking for resilience that nature can give us. Uh, I don't know if you want to speak for just a moment on, on resilience. Yeah, well, you know what? I, I'd like to take that comment and apply it uh, uh, slightly differently, but in the spirit of the question. What's, I think the seminal environmental issue of the next three or four decades, maybe beyond, is the challenge of migration and immigration. And I'm not saying this just because we have a, a manufactured border crisis. Um, this has been happening, this has been building for a long time. And if you really look at the st many studies uh, on this question, most of the dislocations, by no means all, but most of the dislocations are the result of, of environment, their climate, or their some other kind of, uh, their fire. Um, or some kind of flooding. Many, of course, are political, 
and they're, you know, they're inextricably intertwined, the political and the ecological. But this is the issue. And as we think about climate, and, you know, not enough discussion has gone on about this, this will be the question that certainly our children and their grandchildren are going to have to deal with on an everyday basis. So how we think about immigration and migration and people who are new to our communities tells us everything we need to know about a culture and its compassion. So this to me is the most heartfelt question. It is the area where we really have to focus. Now, bringing that back to the bringing the biosphere home idea, I think we have to look at the ecological foundations of migration. And if you look at the biosphere through, you know, hundreds of millions of years, things are always moving. Things are constantly on the move. It is part of the evolutionary ecological process that organisms move from one place to another. So you can't build a wall ever. And it doesn't mean you can't have boundaries or limits or think about uh, the flow of organisms and energy from one place to another, but the flow must be unimpeded. And if you look at human migratory history, it's a miracle that we're here because at one point there were only about 20,000 of us in Africa. And somehow we managed to pop out of that. And in, in a very short period of time, we settled the entire globe. So we're constantly moving around from place to place. And I think we need to, that's where the environmental learning comes in. Mm -hmm. So I like to ask people to trace the background of their own migratory um, families. And because it, you don't have to go over that many generations back. And to also trace the migratory species that live where they live and begin to open up this question so that it's a bigger learning challenge than just whether we build walls or not. And um, I, there's a tremendous amount that environmental learning and big picture thinking has to offer to how we think about this extraordinary challenge. So resilience, getting back to resilience, understanding this migratory necessity, if you will, and why it matters so much to human and ecological flourishing is a way to um, build an under a deeper understanding of what resilience is. Wonderful. Thank you. I certainly agree with, um, with everything you've just said. And maybe that moves us to the final question. And that is your remarkable wrap up, conclusion, uh, the insights that you brought at the end of this conference at Oak Spring. Um, I'd love you just to raise up a few of those for our rethinking and reconsideration. Right. Um, I think that um, I also sang a song about consciousness yes. um, because we always have to marry the heart and the head, as you well know. Uh, I think that this field is changing really dramatically. And it requires a new generation of leadership. And we're already beginning to see that. If you, it, it, most of the action is in cities now. And that's why a lot of these rural colleges, by the way, are struggling. Because this generation understands the necessity of cosmopolitanism. They understand the necessity of having livable cities. They understand that, you know, by the year 2050, over half the world's population will be in cities. So there's a huge demographic shift that way. And cities are also centers of innovation. And if you look at uh, grassroots environmentalism throughout North America, it's probably true around the world, but I don't have that personal experience. It's mostly made up of people between 25 and 40. And then of course, there are those wonderful high school students who are on the front lines of climate activism. And, it's, and it's, there are a tremendous number of women and many people from communities of color. And I think this is the new wave of the future in terms of leadership. And we have to respect it and understand it. And all of these people understand that there is a dir direct correlation between how we think about uh, race, how we think about equity, uh, how we think about democracy, and how we think about environment. So all four of these things have to be included in all aspects of environmental learning. And the quicker K through gray education acknowledges that, the better off we'll all be in terms of where this field goes. So I think we all know this and we all believe this, but I have not yet seen enough tangible educational action to move this forward in an everyday realm. And that's, we need that more than ever right now. There's a lot more to say about all those things. And of course, I've, you know, I've just written my longest book ever about this, which is why it's gonna take another year to come out because that's just the way these things are. Um, but I, I do feel that this, this, our generation built the field of environmental studies. 
In 1969, when I was in college at NYU, there wasn't a single environmental studies class I could take. And then at Antioch, you know, we had the flexibility and the, uh, the opportunity and the um, autonomy to build programs, but it wasn't just me. It was, it was yourself, it was David Orr, it was countless people who understood that there were things they always wanted to study that they didn't have an opportunity to. So we built the programs that we always would have liked for ourselves, and now we've got them. And that's great. But now there's a new generation that needs to take it a step further. And I, honestly, I don't remember the specifics of what I said at the conference because it's always improvisational. It's always, well, what needs to be said right now? But I think what I want to say in this interview to you, and I know you, you get this because you're around the world and you're dealing with all kinds of people all the time and you're at Yale, is there's a new generation of leadership and we have to do everything in our power to mentor them, to yield to them, to learn from them, and that's where we all, all ought to be heading. Mitch, what a fabulous conclusion. I couldn't agree more, everything you've just said, and especially this new integration of social justice with the environment, which is fortunately happening more, I think, as you've said, it's happening here at Yale and so on, because we've had these in two different camps, social justice uh, and the environment, but it's coming together the Pope's encyclical, Laudato Si, is a great example of that. Integral ecology, he's calling it, and so on. So, and the next generation, we are so thrilled to be working with these remarkable Yale students who are very, very committed to this integral ecology um, and new frameworks. And I agree, I like to say we need an intergenerational handshake uh, to- I love students. that. I love that. That's, that's a beautiful expression.